All right, hello, hello, everybody. Yeah, as you can tell, we're professionals at live streams and remote work, so we're just getting started with our remote lessons, things that we've learned. All right, hello, hello, everybody. Um, from yeah, CG as you Cookie. Can tell, so, we're professionals uh, at live as you can tell, we're, we're kind of a little fumbling with this stream, but I think we got it set up. Uh, hello, I'm Wes Burke, CEO and co-founder of CGCookie.com, and with me is Jonathan. Hello, I'm Jonathan. I'm the other co-founder of CG Cookie. <laughs> and uh, so CG Cookie, we're, as you guys know, we're an online education platform. We teach game development. You guys know that because you've paid, and as you mentioned in chat, you guys are awesome members. So the streams, as you know, they're rather candid. They're kind of laid back with a little bit of discussion back and forth, but how this format is going to go for this particular stream is I'm going to talk a little bit about my background. Uh, Jonathan is going to talk about a little about his working background and kind of then just for the next hour, talk about the two main lessons that we've learned as a remote company uh, and then take questions from you uh, and how you guys are, if you're working remote or if you have questions about remote and, and the challenges that you're worried that you may run into. So my background, uh, we've been doing CG Cookie for about 10 years, but prior to that, my working experience was in the game industry. So I spent uh, about 10 years as an environment artist, working very traditional, in person, sitting at a desk, have to be there nine to five. Uh, you can't leave and uh, there's, there's no way that you can uh, work remotely because we don't trust you and you're not gonna be working. So with, with CG Cookie, it's been almost the complete opposite uh, experience for me and I've certainly learned a lot and I think we're con continuing learning. But I know Jay, I would say your experience is quite the opposite. From from yeah, mine. Uh, and real quick before I chime in, uh, Kent mentioned that Wes, your audio, if you can bump it by ten to twenty percent, that would be ideal. Yep. Um, yeah. No, my my experience is very different than the normal. I think um, I have basically done only remote work almost my entire professional life, um, and even before then, uh, I've only ever held one normal job of sorts. Uh, that was a college job. I was working in a media lab. And so that was, you know, local on-site work in the lab every single day. But beyond that, uh, basically my entire career has been remote. Uh, I'm far more comfortable with remote work than I am in in-person work. And so it's just kind of normal for me. Uh, but it's it's been quite an experience in the last 10 years as we've kind of grown CG Cookie beyond just Wes and I to figure out how do you actually not just work as a freelancer remote, but work as a whole team remotely. Um, it's, it's been fun. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, I think, well, you and I worked together, uh, for about two years before we even met each other. I remember, I mean, I think yeah. we, we may have even incorporated CJ cookie before we met each other. Uh, I think we did. Um, I seem to remember that we, we incorporated the business and started like, you know, actually made things official about three to four months before we actually met in person. And, it was only once we met in person that we we signed some paperwork. I don't remember what it was. Maybe it was even just to like you know open a bank account. Yeah. Um, beyond that, everything had been remote for for several years. Um, you know, and it was it was all of the remote work that actually made CG Cookie viable and like show that hey, this is more than just a little side project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was funny. I think it was it's almost it was kind of awkward. I remember meeting you in person for the first time it, and it, not because you're, you're awkward but more yeah, like i awkward. yeah right <laughs> somewhere like this here's a stranger walking up but i remember like well i i know you i but obviously uh yeah well i mean at that point we'd been you know not not only just like working every now and then together but like we've been working practically full time together for two years and you know, didn't really do, we didn't do video chats really. We mostly did audio is mostly text-based um, and we still get along. So <laughs> ish kind of get along. Oh, ish. So, uh, but yeah, we're going to talk about that. I know. So basically that's kind of how, you know, Jay and I, we came together. We, we started remote. Jay, Jonathan was in, in Kansas and I was in Illinois when we were starting CG cookie and, and just getting started. So uh, I, I think the roots of, uh, CG Cookie started re remote and, and it kind of it changed. We were together, then we went remote. But uh, yeah, before we get into the more of that, I do have some slides I'll run through some of the main lessons that we learned. Uh, but we'll kind of take questions 
uh, in spurts. And as other live streams that Kent have done, I know we've had a couple, uh, Ray has already uh, commented, he's planning to start an online business, so he's interested in how remote might work. Or Alejandro is asking him, how would you manage a contract when you're working remote? Uh, when you guys post questions, if you could prefix it in capital letters, question, uh, we'll, we'll try to take note of that and get back to them as uh, we hit different points throughout the, the live stream. And uh, let me see if I can find uh, the slides. So working remote from CG Cookie, I mean, uh, as we've already discussed, everything uh, with CG Cookie is currently remote. We have six full-time employees and, I'm uh, oh, sorry about that ring, my apologies. We have, we have six full-time employees in six different states in, in the United States and around six or so contractors in different cities uh, around the globe. And we've been operating like that probably for about eight years or so. There was a time where, where, where Jay and I and Tim, our concept artist, was in Geneva. Um, so, you know, in general, remote is the dream job, right? I mean, we all think as remote that we're in our pajamas and, wow, that's like the ultimate freedom and the best thing that you can imagine. And uh, hopefully what we're going to talk about this stream is some of those challenges. As you maybe you've already seen with this stream, as Jonathan and I are trying to get this stream going, I'm uh, actually broadcasting from my, my home. I was supposed to be at the studio today, uh, but due to some scheduling conflicts with my wife, and our, we have three three daughters, I was not able to get to the studio. So I'm doing this remotely, uh, which is I thought was rather fitting for this stream. Uh, so we have technology, right? We have technology to do remote work. CG Cookie uses Basecamp pretty much for all of our communication. We use Slack for kind of our daily back and forth. And we use Dropbox for like our file sync. And there's a slew of other tools that will do these same jobs, right? But the technology is there to enable us to do remote work uh, efficiently, effectively, and uh, intently uh, across large teams. But the fact is remote is hard. Remote is probably the most challenging, uh, especially as CG Cookie grows and scales. Uh, it's definitely becoming more of a challenge and, and mostly on the communication aspect, keeping everyone on the same page, uh, company direction, and even just daily communication for solving challenges and how hard that is. But I know, Jay, I think you probably can mention beyond just like the business aspect of it, there's like the, the personal aspect of it, right? I mean, like, how do you manage uh, remote work when you have no door that open and close, right? You don't commute anywhere. Yeah, I mean, I, I think of it in the sense of that the work-life balance, particularly if you're working from home, you know, remote work doesn't necessarily mean that you work from home, but most of us do work from home. Um, you know, it's kind of one of the perks of being remote is that you don't need an office, but getting that, finding that balance with family members, with friends, with yourself to be working is as I think, probably the hardest thing in remote, at least in the beginning. Yeah, I mean, that kind of ties into the question we've got. What were the three hardest challenges uh, to start working remote? And I, I, would, I would agree. Working remote, you know, we have these laptops. We have all this, you know, this technology to help get us through. Um, but yeah, how do you stop? When your laptop is your business, uh, if it's sitting at the dining room table with dinner, if it's sitting uh, on the train, if it's sitting on a vacation, you take it with you because you want to stay in touch with family. Uh, finding that balance or even what I'd like, I don't know if Jay, have you, Jay, have you heard of uh, work-life blend instead of balance? No, I haven't. So basically, in, instead of trying to balance this thing, so like work is this specific on off thing it's more of a balance to make sure that um, you're balancing out your life between work life it's not just this hard stop or it, it's just basically life you know life is this and, and kind of how do you manage that how do you manage your life <laughs> yeah uh exactly so that's one of the biggest challenges the other challenge i mean it used to be tech uh i would say that's less i think mostly maybe well, I'll get into maybe some other challenges because there's uh, these, these slides are going to kind of go over that. So we'll, we'll get into back to that question, I promise. So I want to at least talk about the, the two main things that we have learned uh, from CGP that has helped us along the way. And, and one of those is just the reminder that we work with people. And I, that sounds kind of funny, but I think something that can be easily forgotten is that we all, and we all are talking to Kent all this morning. Sorry, Kent. But we all are humans and we, we have 
we're all working through something and we have little, we have personalities, we have characters and then perceiving that through text is very challenging. So we're always remembering that you're working with other humans that have lives and that are uh, trying to balance everything, I, I think is key. But with that in mind is to invest in team time. And so with CG Cookie, we are a remote crew. So we talk to each other all day long on text and we do try to get to other channels with video and, and phone calls. But so once a year, sometimes twice a year, what we do is we get the team together for company retreats. So I think it's very important where you invest those resources to try to make that happen. So whether that's just, hey, let's drive and meet up somewhere in the middle or let's get the whole team together at uh, the, the CG Cookie Studio in Geneva or a remote location to get that team time in. I think, Jay, you could probably you know, talk a little bit about the retreats, how they're, they're incredibly exhausting, but in the same time rewarding when you walk away. Yeah, I mean, you know, basically the way that we tend to do the retreats, um, and this applies whether we're doing them at the home studio there in Geneva or in a remote location, uh, like some of the photos you saw earlier on the slide were we met up in Virginia last year and went hiking. And, you know, for me, I'm, I'm pretty introverted. I really like my me time. I like quiet time. Um, I don't typically like big groups, but even, even that time, like it's incredibly valuable because just getting together, getting on the same page and having that chance to just like, not even necessarily work through problems, but even just work through ideas and be able to see the spark in somebody's mind or in their eye for what's getting them really excited. What are people not excited about? You know, there's, there's all the, the emotion and communication that comes through when you're in person that is really hard to get and to click with online. Um, it's definitely easier if you do a lot of video chats, but you know, one of the benefits of being remote is that you've got your time to just focus without all of the constant distractions of coworkers walking by, getting tapped on the shoulder and things like that. Um, so having, having these dedicated times once or twice a year to get together, be in the same room and mostly just get on the same page for what are we as a company trying to do? What are the things that we value? What's important? Um, and even just enjoying spending time together, you know, we're a, particularly for us, we're a small team. Um, I think for the most part, we all really like each other and we like spending time together. Uh, and it's, it's really valuable to just even have that relationship building that otherwise it's hard to do when you're remote, you know, particularly when you work with somebody strictly online and even more so if you don't spend a lot of time, say video chatting with them, you don't really get to build that personal relationship all that well. Um, or I mean, even if you do, it's, it's difficult. And so having that time in the same room, you know, whether you're playing a game together, whether you're working on a project, whether you're eating dinner, maybe you're making dinner or going fishing or hiking. Those are things that you set the work aside and you just get to know the person and you can't really undervalue that because it's, it's huge. Uh, yep. That's where I think the real value of the retreat comes in. I mean, frankly, like we get a lot of work done during the retreats, but we don't do a lot of work. If that makes sense, <laughs> you know, we don't produce much during a retreat. No, I would even say that was hard initial when we started doing our retreats. It was always like, well, how how much do you plan on a retreat? Like, right? Like, how much do you schedule? How can, do you, do you schedule? You know, teamwork building class one hundred and one. We're going to learn how to become a team. Like, no, and I I think we found that out fairly quickly. Our first retreat was very lax. We had zero structure. Uh, when we did it, we got together for about a week. Um, but I think we've learned that we do now have some scheduled talks when we do our retreats. So we do like, uh, but not really, it was almost to say like most anti-corporate type of retreat. Like that's kind of what we're, we're, we're striving for. We don't want to be like, right, we're, we're talking about the specific thing, but in more what, what Jay was saying, it's more about like just updating the team. So like we might do, I'll do a state of the cookie where I'll get up and, uh, talk about just how is the CG cookies doing as a whole, the direction, just to make sure, again, everyone's on the same path and vision because some of that can get you little fissures throughout the year and we're all kind of craving to go back together. Jay will do a big update on the, you know, the blender market. So it's not that formal, but it's more communicative and sharing of knowledge of things that are scheduled. And I think, you know, what we found out, it's almost, we would schedule for a couple meetings in the morning and then the afternoon, we'd never schedule anything but we'd have stuff going until midnight almost every day. Yeah. Well, and like, 
you know, one of the things that's really nice about the the retreats is, oh, apparently my volume is a little bit low. I'll try and get closer to my mic. Um, one of the things that kind of comes out of a lot of the retreats, particularly in the afternoons and evenings, is strictly organic. Uh, you know, whether it's an idea that was sparked from a discussion, whether it's just, you know, two people sitting in a corner drawing that then come up with something that they get really excited about, you know, be that, be that a game, be it new training, be it a way to solve X problem. You don't know, you don't know what those things are going to be, but we never see the amount of energy on a day-to-day -day basis remotely that we do in that one week of, you know, basically powwow time of sorts for lack of a better word uh and i think this is one of the things that makes it so exhausting like there's no way that we could do it every single month i think it would it would lose the value we would stop enjoying them and definitely from all the travel because of course we're spread all over the country and in some cases the world so traveling would be real challenging at that point but doing it doing it once a year or twice a year you know kind of gives you that energy to then push forward for the next three to six months and yeah, and there's some chat. There's, uh, I think there's actually four Jonathans that work. There are each. four Jonathans. Yeah, so there's uh, obviously you, Jonathan Gonzalez, Jonathan Lampel, and Dr. John yeah. Denning, right? Yeah. So we have four. We could see if we can get to five. Oh, I don't know what happens when we get to five. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, something. Yeah, I think, you know, Chart is asking, how do we address all the Jonathans in the room? I think everyone kind of has a little bit of a nickname. I think. Uh, I, at least for, for me, I guess maybe I'll, I'll answer that. So obviously I called J, J, and I probably call Jonathan Lampel, just K, Lampel. Uh, Jonathan Gonzalez likes to go by Gonzo, and uh, Dr. John Denning just goes by John. So I think that's the distinctions, at least for me. When, J, John, Lampel, Gonzo? Yeah. Pretty wild. Uh, all right, let's go back to the, the slide. So, I mean, to kind of at least wrap up that point is we found it's incredibly valuable to in, invest in team. And... Uh, that seems like maybe a no-brainer or like, well, yeah, of course, but that's not always the case in, in groups or companies when you get together. But that's something we believe in very heavily in is that, you know, as you're typing on Slack, picking up context, you know, usually if Jonathan or Jay sends me a message, I can tell if he's frustrated. I can tell if he's happy. You know, we still don't know sometimes, and that's the hard part about text, but we learn that from our FaceTime. We learn that from our face. Uh, in person at retreats and learning people's mannerisms and their personality, you really get to know the person behind the text. So when you have those challenging days when, holy cow, the, the ship's on fire and we have to solve a problem, you can react and work with that person better. Well, I think that's a really good point. Like, you know, with remote work, particularly through Slack and even, even Basecamp to a degree, you know, for anybody that's not familiar, Slack is the real time chat system that we use. Um, very similar to Discourse, which maybe a lot people, or Discord, uh, which a lot of people are going to be familiar with. Um, and then Basecamp is basically our asynchronous project management service. Um, you know, you lose all sense of emotion in writing, particularly because we're, we're typing quickly. It's in short sentences. It's brief. You're very seldom actually writing out full paragraphs. And unless everybody on the team has identical punctuation and writing styles, which we don't, it's, you miss all of the emotion typically that's conveyed in a sentence. Now, I think like for Wes and I, we've been working together long enough, like that he said, we can kind of just, we recognize when maybe somebody's being a little bit more emphatic and they're not very happy with what they're doing. <laughs> so we can kind of see that in the writing style. But like when you introduce a new team member, you haven't spent a lot of time with them. You don't know how they write, you know. For example, like I've had a, um, a contact in another process where they write very formal and because they come from the legal legal world and every email is like, you know, hello, first name, colon, indent, this is what we should do today, period. It's very, very formal, but it feels stale. But then when you talk to them in person, you realize that's just the way that they write because of the world that they've been in. It has nothing to do with their emotion. And unless you start to learn how somebody writes, you miss all of the context. And so having that FaceTime where you can then kind of connect somebody's writing habits with their actual personality, it's really, really helpful. <laughs> super, super helpful. All right, so you kind of segued into my, my next point is that another big thing that we've learned at CG Cookie 
And we're still, and anyway, all these things we've learned, I, I would not say we're great at any of them yet, but we're, they're always a work in progress, but you just know when to switch mediums. So, you know, as Jay was talking on, there's asynchronous communication, meaning uh, it's not real time. So we're, we're, we're chatting, I can put in my, a big discussion, I can post it, someone can come back an hour later, a day later, digest it, and really gather their thoughts before they respond. So that's like asynchronous communication. So that's kind of commenting on a GitHub issue that is leaving a discussion on Basecamp or as anyone ever experienced, uh, you know, a discussion forum, right? So that's kind of asynchronous communication. It's not real time, it's not chat. Um, and that's perfect for majority of the communication. And that's what really works well with remote, especially with different time zones. I would highly encourage if you're, if you're starting up a remote team, build that into ground one, that this is how you communicate. So this is our main communi communication process or handbook is this, asynchronous communication through Basecamp, through whatever forum software you're using. Uh, I, I would almost recommend building that as a ground floor. And then you would kind of bolt on these other tools uh, depending on different challenges and, and situations that you that you come across. So in my example, you know, we have... Uh, three different scenarios, if I hit the right arrow, and it kind of talks about the different communication levels that we work through here at CG Cookie. So we have the base, the foundation. So I think it's really quick, and I'm gonna beat a dead horse, but when everyone kind of starts up, there's, oh cool, let's get our Slack thing going, let's get our Discord chat going, and this is how we're gonna operate and, and going forward. Again, try to, keep, I would almost keep that as a secondary thing. Build your, your foundation core communication first, and then add real time. Uh, and that's what you kind of notice, which means. So an example, like in CG Cookie, we'll have a discussion going in Basecamp. And we'll kind of get to a point where I know, and it, just, it needs to be hashed out quicker. Or we find ourselves on the discussion in Basecamp. People are responding within a minute of each other on Basecamp. Stop, take a breath, and maybe go to Slack or, or just step away for a little bit. It's okay to step away from a conversation and allow other people to have time to input their thoughts. And so then you'd switch to real-time communication to hash it out. But if that's still not working, you're going back and forth for an hour, super fast. Not a lot of people are getting their thoughts in, or it's basically who can type the fastest is getting their point across. I would highly recommend that you switch to visual communication. So kind of like what we're doing today, you know, seeing Jonathan and I talk, you're, you're catching up little mannerisms. If I'm moving my hands, if I'm, you know, Frowing, being upset. There's little things that you can pick up on with video communication. So that's kind of like our, our end point. So if there's any disagreements within CG Cookie or, or any, um, I guess, miscommunication within CG Cookie, always recommend that we go to video chat to hash it out. I would say 99.9 .9 times out of the time, even if you know Jay and I, you've ever and I have ever seemed to have a disagreement uh, on discussion or chat. Anytime we've gone to video or even audio, it, it seems like, oh, that's what you meant, or it, it's it's gone within a minute or two. Well, and like, you know, any time that, I'll just echo what you said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what Wes said, but in my voice. <laughs> when, when we have a disagreement, you, you get on a call, you hash it out, and it, Typically, the way that works, like beyond just coming to a consensus on or coming to an agreement is we typically discover really quick that we didn't actually even have a disagreement. We had a misunderstanding. Oh, yeah. We really we seldom have legitimate disagreements in the team, you know, not not <laughs> not disagreements that that survived through discussion. You know, every now and then we'll have something that like we just have, we'll have a different take on how we should approach a problem or a solution or whatever in the beginning, but not necessarily because one is right and one is wrong. It's just, hey, do we take this approach or do we take this approach? And invariably, anytime that we have a frustrating disagreement, that gets resolved very quickly when using a voice chat. Not so quickly if we don't actually choose to get on a call. Yeah, and I think it's recognizing that that point, right? Like when, and I think that's still something we're still learning of like, all right, just, just let's get in a call and uh, making that first step to say that is kind of almost hard in itself. Yeah. <laughs> well, because as you as you tend to disagree more and more, you know, human nature, you have this tendency to dig in your heels 
and dig in further and further. <laughs> <laughs> I've never done that. You've never done that. No, no, no. We don't. We don't do that. We're perfect. <laughs> As we've kind of said, what you know. Uh, what were you're my second marriage as far as this business is goes or what? yeah the amount of time we spend together and the amount of uh conversations we've had back and forth uh, of certain we talk a lot we talk a lot that's for sure it's been up there so I don't know, that might be the end of my slide so yeah basically now we're, we're, we're kind of doing just go those are two main things i know that's like you know, we, about a half hour i wanted to cover at least the two main lessons there's a bunch of little things that i would still love to share that we cg cookie has done to kind of help uh uh, in remote communication and I can share some personal things. Jonathan can share some personal things or if you guys in the, in the chat have specific questions on setting up a remote team, even the tools we use, um, I don't like to focus too much on the tools. I kind of like to talk more about the psychology of remote. Um, at least for me, I know that's been very challenging. Uh, like I said, I got three kids, uh, three daughters age uh, 10, 7, and, and 5 and you know, managing work, life, all that stuff has been really difficult for me. Even though I'm fortunate, we have this, I have the studio here uh, that I can go into. Uh, obviously, days like this where the schedules did not align, and any kind of balancing that has been hard. And, and even the weekends, I know Jay, and I think you and I probably still probably check in quite a bit when we're not supposed to, right? Oh yeah, uh, I've gotten a lot better about it in the last, I'd say, a year and a half to two years. Uh, but I still, you know, I don't think I've gone with the exception of when I literally didn't have my laptop with me. Um, and I removed all business apps from my phone for a weekend or so for a vacation. <laughs> I don't think I've gone a more than three days without checking in in some form or fashion oh, in 10 years. Wow. Uh, for better, for worse. Yeah. Right. I know that's the, the, the hard part. I would agree. I think I've gotten a, a little bit better, but you know, it's, Admittedly, what's helped, uh, as I'm clipping my audio, what, what's helped me is honestly, I think our team. You know, as absolutely, we've been fortunate now that we have a team to kind of help the load. But in the early days, that's really hard to do when it was. Oh yeah. You know, support, design, development, everything is like. Well, if you get uh, a support ticket coming in at seven o'clock, that you really want to help that person out. Like you don't want them to wait and have a bad experience uh, with CG Cookie or get things like we don't care, but. Um, which it's harder when you're, when you're smaller. Uh, well, and I would say that like now, you know, basically 10 years on as the team has matured, our processes have matured. <clears throat> now, you know, finding the work-life balance is more about habit than it is necessity. Yeah. Early on, you know, as we were getting started, it just took a lot of work to make this happen. And, you know, it was being online at 2 p or 2 a.m. answering questions from a release or whatever. Those were some of the things that, while not required, definitely helped us get started in the beginning, regardless of whether they were healthy. Um, <laughs> now it's, you know, we spent so long building those habits that we could have probably saved ourselves a, a lot of pain early on or now if we had built better habits from the beginning. Because now it's more about retraining ourselves than it is, you know, being disciplined. Oh yeah, I know. If you guys remember, if you've been with CG Cookie for a while, uh, we're on our sixth version of the site, but uh, we're getting better at launches. But a couple of our launches, I think, one we were down for forty-eight hours. I think trying to uh, get the site back online at the back oh, in the was day. No sleep in those four. Yeah, back whatever. in the day, we used to kind of like ah, it should be okay. <laughs> it's launch. <laughs> Some very long nights yeah, launching. We try to do two less of those. We're, we're certainly better with the the talent of Mr. Nick Haskins and crew to help make sure we're not nearly as, as rough around the edges. Uh, there's a question from Rain. She's asked, is there any particular reason not to use Discord? Uh, no, I, I mean... I have one very particular reason, actually. Oh, I don't say I don't have any, but unless uh, Jonathan has uh, one, so let you know. But as a... Um, I think Discord is awesome. It's a cool service. They built a sweet tool and obviously it's grown very, very quickly. Um, I tend to try to avoid uh, free services um, that are exclusively free because when it is exclusively free, you are the product. And when we're using it as a business tool, that's not something that is very comforting. Um, whether or not they say they're selling it or not, I would question it directly on whether or not. I think Discord says they do. I, I think they... I think they're up front and say that they do, though. I, I just read something because we're, we're getting very much into uh, 
I'm going to GPDR, right? GD, oh, yeah, yeah GDPR. Yeah, with uh, and how information is handled. And I think Discord mm -hmm. was in somewhere that I read that they're, they're fairly open in what they do with your information. And I believe, uh, I, I'm not going to quote. So I'll just read their terms and see what they say. But uh, similar concerns, I guess. Free software, right? But how are they, how are they making their money? There, I mean, there's, there's another aspect to it, which is simply that whenever we started using Slack, Discord was barely a blip on the radar. Um, I think I think it was around at the time, but we weren't even aware of it. Um, and so, even if we didn't have concerns with the data side, you know, not to say that Slack is perfect because Slack definitely does some things with data that we would probably prefer that they don't. Um, but at that point in time, Slack was just kind of what we went with, and we had actually transitioned from a few different softwares. We had used HipChat for a little while. We oh, used, there's another one, yeah. There's yeah, a few. I don't remember what the other one was, but we do. We've gone through several different chat systems. You know, we started on Skype, uh, and when it was just Wes and I, Skype was fine. The moment you add a third person, fourth person, fifth person, Skype goes downhill real quick. Mm -hmm. um, but at this point, you know, even if we wanted to, it probably wouldn't be worth it to make a switch. So it's just easier to use what we already have versus switching to something like Discord. Um, Discord, from my experience on this usability side, is really, really great if you have a lot of people that you want to be able to join without having to sign up, without you know having invitations, just basically to effectively have an IRC channel. Discord's awesome for that. Um, Slack is a little bit more closed. Yeah. I don't even, even uh, you know, for tools, you know, Basecamp, uh, which we, again, we just haven't changed course where, you know, even a tool like Basecamp has chat. It has um, the asynchronous communication with discussions and to do's and stuff built in. But, you know, even there's a bunch of them, uh, Asanza, and there, there's so many tools now uh, that you can choose from. Uh, and I think, you know, one of the things, because I know we've got several people here in the chat who have mentioned that you're you're working on starting a business you know be it remote or otherwise something to keep in mind as you're starting obviously cost is going to be an issue you know some tools are cheaper than others some are free that's of course always going to be a, be an issue but the other thing to consider is what's the longevity of the business and not not your business but the the service that you're utilizing you know be it slack basecamp discord or something else you know you have to ask yourself are you confident that you can invest the time into using this service as a team, knowing that it will still be here tomorrow, right. next year, two years from now? So, you know, one for, as just as an example, so we use Basecamp as our project management system. And we're really comfortable with that beyond just the fact that we like the tool. But as you start to learn more about the company and the service and how they operate, there's a very, very good certainty that they will still be here 10 years from now, just based on how they operate, how they make money, how they pay for services, how they pay their team. Those kinds of things matter, you know, because particularly when you start talking about free services with many free services that are, say, investment backed based on the number of eyes that they can capture, you never know when they're just going to shut down tomorrow. Yeah, that's a very good point. Don't know. You know, my, even though this isn't a business tool, a good example is RDIO, R -D -I -O, which was the uh, streaming music service that competed with Spotify that was purchased by Pandora. And basically, like, it was it was beautiful. It was operating. Um, people were paying for it. And then one day, they get bought by Pandora. And the very next day, they were shutting down within 30 days. If that were something like Basecamp, like, if we'd had all of our time and projects invested in that, and then suddenly they announced they're shutting down in 30 days, and you have only that window to move everything off, it'd be debilitating. Like we would lose so much time just trying to move all of our projects and off of it. Hmm. So, <laughs> I never thought about conscious. that. Yeah, hopefully uh, Basecamp never goes away. <laughs> yes, this is true. <laughs> um, like, uh, so you just got to be conscious of, you know, what services you're using and what happens if that service disappears because they do. Yeah, very good point. So yeah, another question, uh, do you ever just, do you only call for work or do you ever just call each other to talk with someone while you work. And uh, yeah, we're, we're trying to, we've done that a few times where we just kind of, uh, we did it probably two or three weeks ago where I just, we did a stream through uh, Zoom, I think it was, or maybe Slack video. And it said in our general chat, it was, you know, four or five o'clock on a Thursday and CG Cookie is a four day work week. So we work uh, Monday through Thursday, the, the, the full-time employees and we have Fridays off. But so on Thursday is kind of like our, 
I don't know what I forget what Nick calls it. Fr- Friday, Friday, something, but Thursday. Friday casual or something. Yeah, but we yeah, I just opened up a stream and said, "Hey, uh, video chat, come join." And as people came on the chat, we're like, "All right, the rule is you cannot talk about work." And it's funny how initially everyone's kind of reaction is to like want to talk about work and but <laughs> even for me it's hard like the people are like yeah have you seen uh, the google analytics lately or something and you're like ah, no nope, we can't talk about that and once you got past the initial don't talk about work uh, it was a really cool stream and then you ended up going for like an hour and a half of just people hanging out uh kind of just shooting the crap of you know what's going on that day what's going on in their lives and i think that it was cool because I think everyone felt, at least I did, I felt really good and reconnected with those people who were on that stream versus if we've done like another video meeting status update. Yeah, it's something that we should probably do more often, um, particularly as the team grows, you know, trying to encourage basically like casual conversation that really matters, particularly for, I mean, and, and not to like get like strategic about it, but you really want your team to like each other and to get along well. <laughs> and it's nice when you can not chat about work and have a conversation and enjoy it. You know, I still love, um, I, this This is from, this would have been like 2008 politics, I think it was, but it was somebody like decide, like judge how they evaluate a candidate was, do I wanna have a beer with this person? Mm. And I always thought that was kind of awesome. Just like, it doesn't matter what, you know, pick your beverage of choice, pick your dinner of choice, whatever. If this is somebody that you would enjoy, like that's awesome. Right. And having that kind of like promoting that is awesome. And we should do more of it. I think even that goes even to me the hiring of the remote team that, you know, at least for me, when we look at people who were looking to uh, assimilate and trick to join CG Cookie, <laughs> we, uh, you know, I, it's really half skill for me and half Sorry, guys. personality, half, half character, because I really think the skill can be taught, the skill can be learned. Uh, especially with the, the, in the environment, our, our environment is very entrepreneurial. But when you run into those challenging times of, oh my gosh, the site's down, or oh my gosh, we had something happened, you're going to have to deal with that person very intimately. And you're going to have to be working with them and their character. That's really what's going to help you overcome, overcome and solve problems. Uh, yeah. Is that. Well, and it's, it's, through, it's through real interaction where you learn how to deal with somebody and and i and i say deal not in a negative sense but just in the like like i mean to take wes and i like we we have had real disagreements before i have hung up on wes before he I has have i've not hung up on yes. him so i owe him one this i'm waiting true. for it one day i'm gonna Actually, get you I'm yeah. hang up. Uh, <laughs> but it's only through those like non-work relations that then suddenly when we have a real problem at hand we recognize when somebody is just feeling a little frayed around the edges versus when they're like mad at you as a person and you know that there's a big difference between that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those many years ago so, that that happened, but I, 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 I've, I've gotten over it. I don't hang on to a grudge, so it's fine. Oh, that's good. We're, we're fine. It's yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah. It's me. It's not you. Uh, another question: uh, As hard as it is working remote, do you still prefer to it working at a studio? You've had experience. Have you had the experience basically compare the two options? Uh, that's a good one for you having worked at Robomoto and high voltage and all those yeah uh, yeah it's it's quite a different life I, I will admit I mean the the lifestyle is way different and I, I kind of so my my background is a with the school I was told you know I ended up doing uh, military then I went to college and then I was supposed to get a job and that the very traditional path and over that time it was very nine to five and, and studio oriented especially that time in the game industry, it was you show up at you know ten, you leave at six. Uh, at six was early, <laughs> and then uh, you go out there. There is aspects that I do miss about in person, and but I think that's felt when we do our company retreats. Like you know, we get that team together. That's certainly fun. And there's probably there probably are some lonely days that I have that I probably just call Jonathan or any of the team members randomly, and I'm like, hey, what are you doing? Uh, and they're always like. What are you calling me? Working. And I'm working. Why are you bothering me? Uh, so I think yeah. on that aspect, I do miss. It would be really. There's some days I would love to have the whole crew here at the CG Cookie Studio, and I, I think it would, a lot would be done. But I think that's what the company retreats are because when we get those together, everyone's excited. We get together, and when it's done, everyone then can go to their own caves and get the work done. 
And because I think even with remote work, um, it's just as challenging as I think Jonathan was talking about the, you know, the taps on the shoulder. So if you're in a studio environment, uh, typically the studios I worked at would have headphone rules and laws. If you have my headphones on, you cannot bother me. But even then, it I mean, you're all in these cubicles next to each other. So someone would come by like, hey, did you see uh, Ready Player One yet? And you're like, oh, let me answer you. And then you sit down and then uh, there's there's multiple. I think there's more distractions within a studio. Uh, but there's also, I miss the the collaborative excitement. So like even when uh, originally Jonathan moved to here in Geneva to work and Tim Van Ruden uh, joined us as a concept artist and the three of us in the studio was fun. It's a very fond time that I, I look back to especially when we were faced with a challenge i remember i would go to the restroom and come back and be like i got it you know and we'd work on how to fix it and and we'd then get you'd feel everyone's excitement uh, to overcome that challenge so i do miss a little bit of that uh of the two that i prefer i'd still prefer remote uh over in the studio any day uh, but hopefully i would maybe try to get regular on having two company retreats a year. I think that would be pretty sweet. Or smaller gatherings where I think Jay, we've talked about where like we just get a small portion of the team. They're like, oh, you know what? You want to go meet Matthew for work on the blender market. You guys just meet halfway, which you've done before. And mm -hmm. just maybe more of that. Yeah. And I, you know, I think I'd just add to that. Like you definitely, there's a lot of little things that working remotely that you miss from having, having a studio space with everybody in the same building. Those, those little sparks of motivation or problem solving that definitely happens, particularly on the creative side. You know, if you're, if you're sketching out a game design, you're sketching out a character, those things are really nice to be able to bounce ideas off of somebody quickly in the same room. I think what you gain on the remote side is the, is the long-term big picture ability for people to do work. Um, it's, it's harder to get going, but I think it's really successful. Yeah, and I, I will I will uh, interject. So as remote, I, my my three kids are fighting just upstairs. So if you hear that, that is that is what's going on. And this is remote life. So I, I apologize, but that's uh, um, the I'll, downside I'll of the remote side. Right. Chime in on the question from Jade Otterart on how do you guys handle time management? Uh, you know, that's definitely I think to to kind of reemphasize remote aspect. This is one of the things that's really beneficial about remote work is we don't manage time as a company we don't handle time management. It is entirely up to the individual employee. And so, you know, if just as myself as an example, like I like to, I like to get started by about eight, eight thirty in the morning. I'll typically work till 11. I'll take an hour for lunch and then I'll work for a couple of hours, take a mid afternoon break, work for a couple more hours before dinner, and then maybe do a little bit of work after dinner. Like that's my typical day. But if, for example, like, um, if, if we've got a doctor's appointment, if there's something that needs to be done in the middle of the afternoon, you just go do it. It's okay. Um, you know, if, if your best time to go to the gym is, you know, Monday at 10 AM, just go to the gym Monday at 10 AM. At the end of the day, you know, we don't, we don't do it so much as time management versus expectations, you know, for each person, there's a set of expectations so far as like, Hey, this is the work that needs to be done. Is that work getting done? Cool. Beyond that. We don't care. You know, it's, we're not, it comes down to trust too. Right. I mean, I think we, we have the environment where we trust everyone on the team that yeah. they're doing the work because they have the best, the company is, is in the, in the best interest. And, but, and frankly, if, if we didn't trust a person to do their work and to be honest about the time that they're putting in, that's not somebody that we would hire. And, you know, that's not to say that it couldn't happen. It, it certainly could. Um, but, you know, that's where you you go through, you know, a maybe a more involved hiring process, basically, like, how well does this person fit within the, the culture, within the process? You know, is this somebody that is very self-motivated and driven and able to just do their work without needing a manager? You know, I think that's one thing that we really believe in pretty strongly is we don't have managers. Um, a, because we're not big enough to have managers, you know, yes, we have, you know, we'll like assign somebody as a project lead or something like that. Somebody that is ultimately responsible for making sure a project happens, but there's nobody leaning over your shoulder say, Oh, did you put enough hours today? That that's not a thing. Um, cause it, in our opinion, it's not productive. Yeah. So, uh, there's another question, you know, it's right. Same subject, you know, uh, 
said it's pretty easy to keep tabs or therefore trust everybody because we're small. And uh, that could be the case. I know we're uh, huge fans of the company base camp themselves, and, and we try to we model a little bit of our culture and processes after them. But they're much like they have fifty plus employees, and uh, they're able to still maintain that culture. Um, of trust and you know not time management and no micromanagement of the team though i imagine jay if we were to scale to that size that we, we'd have those challenges right i think that that's those are probably just naturally going to happen uh well and you know that makes it easier it to do when we're smaller there's definitely a, a a segue beyond the original question but you know there's this motivation within definitely within entrepreneurial work but particularly in the 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 tech world of just grow, 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 grow. Like all the emphasis is on grow. And, you know, maybe that's the time that you add. Like if you're getting to the point that you're big enough that you can no longer just trust your team completely, maybe that's when you ask yourself, well, hold on a second. Do we need to grow bigger? Can we do more with less or just stay healthy? You know, though those are much larger questions that cannot be condensed into a single sentence because they're so <laughs> particular to the the individual business and team and whatnot but yeah it's you know it i will say and just echo west that with the size of our team that is something that we're able to do is we can trust everybody completely because we're small mm -hmm. but i'm still not convinced that up to a certain point that you can't continue to do that yeah you know if you've got thousands of employees that's very different uh yeah sorry distracted again but um, the other question was you know how many people have offices at cg cookie and uh so they say one one person no i uh well basically I'm, I'm the fortunate one i do live uh originally so we got the studio when jonathan and i first met in 2010 so we have a brick and mortar studio here in geneva illinois in the united states and it's a, it's a small studio, small little box is kind of what we were searching for. And at that time, then Jonathan lived here and we all worked out of there. And then over time, you know, what's really neat about our culture is that, you know, Jonathan said, hey, uh, my wife, she's got a job in California. We're going to go there. Okay. They moved. And guess what? We still grew the business. We still worked. We still uh, produced you know, every, nothing failed uh, from him being in California. And then I think a couple of years later, Tim, our concept artist, said, hey, man, I really want to go back to Wisconsin, um, which is a state just north of Illinois. And we're like, okay, cool. You know, so it's it was great to have those conversations. Instead of those being, I need to leave the company because I can't work at this studio, they were just location changes. So we didn't lose any talent. We didn't lose any uh, motivation or uh what do you call it, inertia of where the company was going. It just locations changed. But this let's led to, we do still have the studio here in Geneva that uh, I'll work out of. And we do have a couple contractors that will come out of the studio. But then everyone else uh, works from home. And they're, uh, as Jonathan, you're in your basement, correct? I am, I am in my basement. I have a dedicated office in my basement. Um, it's my, when, when these doors are shut, I'm not to be disturbed. That doesn't always work very well, but that's the idea. <laughs> Doesn't help that I don't really shut the doors typically, but you know. Yeah. Um, and I think some well, of the crew, you know, and we mix it up. We're yeah, I know I'm going to go to the coffee shop today. I'm going to that's where I'm going to work today is at the coffee shop, or I'm going to go out to the park. You know, so there's uh, I know that the other uh, employees of CG Cookie will mix it up just to have a change of pace. Mm -hmm. Oh, and during the summer, like I'll I'll go to one of the local parks and just you know turn on my hotspot on my phone and work on my laptop in the park. Just again for that change of scenery, change of pace, um, get some sunshine. Mm -hmm. Always need a little extra sunshine. Sunshine, I know. I know. I try to work out. I have a, a basement office as well, but it's very gloomy, and so I'm excited to be able to look out a window right now. Yeah. Um, Char Hunter, you had a question on where do you work with clients? Where do you meet them? Um, frankly, we don't really do client work. Um, you know, like Wes alluded to, we we have a few contractors there in the Chicago area that we'll meet with from time to time, and at that point we typically meet with them in the studio. Um, but at this point, you know, CG Cookie is entirely self-focused in that we we produce the education, education, we sell the memberships, and that is what we do. You know, we are no longer a, a contract company. We used, to, we used to run a little production studio, um, basically from like 2010 to 2012 or so. Uh, and we would do production work on a contract basis. And that was fun, but 
stressful. Yeah. Yeah. Stressful. Um, yeah. More stressful than it was rewarding. Uh, we, it's, it's, we found, you know, the main difference on it was we needed to make a decision on whether or not we were going to be a production studio working on behalf of other clients, or if we were going to do our own work, we couldn't really continue to do both. And so we decided to do our own. So. Yeah, which I remember that big switch because we were taking on. There's the the at least for us, we we're fortunate that we had the the education side as like another business pillar, right? So we had the education side going, and we also had the studio side going because of our background. We all we worked in the industry. We had clients. We've come from film and game backgrounds, so we were uh, like, wow, we can take on these freelance jobs. You know, if you get a really nice freelance job, it can be enticing to see those dollars up front. Uh, of what that might be, uh, but we started to find out that those started to become a distraction of really where our our focus and our passion was was creating the experience of CG Cookie for its tutorials and, and even our own passion. So we we were fortunate enough where we created our no hit wonder iPad game uh, Eat Sheep, and uh, we've been pursuing more uh, passion projects as we we've been as the years have passed. But that's where I think. It was a smart decision for us that we were able to, and one, that we were fortunate to be able to do that. Uh, but I do remember well, that being a very distinctful, you know, like, all right, we need to stop taking contract work as a studio and we are going to be this. And I mean, during that process, you know, we had been doing contract work both because we enjoyed it, but also to try and basically pay the bills. You know, we basically needed more revenue streams to pay the bills. That's uh, true. Probably so a lot of that. They, I mean, because we did uh, a couple of those contracts for Robo Moto. Mm -hmm. Out of the gate, the, if you guys are familiar with the in time movie mobile app, a uh, mobile game, uh, Jonathan sure. and I and uh, Paul Hoffner, uh, we, we created that. CG Cookie is the tertiary contractor on that game. Yeah, I actually forgot about that one. Um, you know, and, and this is something that I think that everybody has to go through, particularly if you're building a business, is unless you happen to be independently wealthy and can afford to just spend as much time as you need on your project getting getting off the ground is really hard like maybe one of the hardest points um and so like for us that was one of the ways that we did it was we had the education business that we were trying to grow and that we were expanding and trying to just pay the bills with but in order to augment that we then did contract work as a secondary business so that we had two different sources of revenue so that when the education side fell the contract work would kind of pick up and vice versa but it took doing that for like two, three years before we could make the jump to say, all right, the education, CG Cookie as a training site and service is making enough money that we can do 100% that. Had we not done the contract work, we probably wouldn't be here today. Um, yeah. And, you know, I, I mean, I think I remember whenever we decided to stop doing contract work, it was this real scary question of like, can can we survive without this? Like, are we going to regret this decision? And thankfully we managed to, to do it, but there was, it was not a clear, yeah, we can afford it. It yeah. was, I hope we can afford it. <laughs> I guess that's probably something we can touch on uh, too, is that, um, yeah, throughout this process, you know, I always say the, the one constant in business are, is the ups and the downs where, Almost every decision we've made and big decisions we've made has always almost made me sick to the stomach of what we're about to do, though it always was the right move to kind of push past the uncomfortable zone. So I think, you know, anything that you're trying to progress and iterate, you know, when we launched uh, the Blender 2.5 training series, I remember being very, very nervous and like, wow, do this. And then your workshop, uh, I remember launching that and launching a new site and doing all these things is scary. Um, yeah, it's that, that risk reward, but you know, I guess it's my point is make sure. Like, I always kind of say, if I'm feeling uncomfortable about something, it's mostly me being selfish or scared about ready to push ourselves to the next level. And I think that's what holds a lot of people back is that if you don't push yourself outside your normal comfort zone, um, you're never going to see the results that you're you're trying to get. Yeah. Well, and if anything, even beyond just results. Pushing yourself outside the comfort zone is a chance to learn something new, to grow. And, you know, there's lots of things that we have learned in the process of the last 10 years that we never would have learned if we'd stayed comfortable. Yeah. Uh, and things that are now incredibly valuable to us. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, well, I'm glad to hear it's normal, Char. I, I, <laughs> there are others. You guys, I am somewhat human. That's good to hear. Um, uh, 
we do have a we have a question on offering CG Cookie in other languages so that we could reach more people in more countries. And you know, th I think this is something we've always wanted to do. Um, we love the idea of it. The the implications of actually doing it are very difficult. Um, you know, there's there's lots of services now where we can transcribe captions and things like that, um, but they're not great. We <laughs> we would like to, but we have a hard enough time offering our training just in English already that it's challenging to do or to think about trying to then suddenly offer it in two languages or three languages or four. Um, and so the way we've kind of looked at it, at least for now, is you know English is our native language. It is a for better for worse it is the quote unquote unifying language um as fortunate as we are on that uh yeah it's it's tricky you know the one thing that i would say is that we would love to offer it in multiple languages but we won't do it unless we can do it right which really means hiring native speakers in each of those languages to do the training directly and that's not something that we have the resources to do right now no, we don't. I know there's also the question of what's the CG cookie plan for the future? Uh, I'm really investing you guys. So thanks for hanging with us. It's uh, obviously the community is CG cookie. So uh, I know it sounds cliche, but thanks for hanging with us. Uh, I'll touch on a little bit. No, I mean, Jay, me, me talk to you about the blender market, the sums that we have, because CG cookie is the education side. So we say that, but also we have little startup projects of our own. We have uh, the Sculpt Box, we have Read Topo Flow, we have the Blender Market itself, and uh, we're, we're trying to grow them, even though those are brand new businesses. But I would say one of the, the, the visions of CG Cookie is probably, as I might have to leave this stream, wouldn't that be like the typical cliche remote thing? They are, they are still alive, but they are fighting over a toy. The... <laughs> Is basically the more the experience. So where you know I say CG Cookie is not just a training site, and and I don't ever want to be perceived as that. Where we are more, I say, is like the country club for artists. Where we want to find a safe place that you can come online, interact with other artists around the world, uh, share experiences, network, and learn uh, along the way. And I think you're starting to see some of that with us investing in live streams, live classes, these live events where. Uh, obviously, you're seeing the really real side of CG Cookie and the crew behind that makes the site, right? Our families, uh, uh, the, us fumbling through, getting a live stream going on. Like, that's us. And we, we, we don't take ourselves too seriously. And I, I really want to get more of that type of uh, community feeling out with CG Cookie. Obviously, on the, the business content side, uh, we're continuing to grow our, our startups with uh, the Blender Market and some of our, our sub projects with our tool development on the the blender side uh, yeah yeah I, I can kind of chime in on the blender mm -hmm. market uh you know the blender market for anyone that's not aware uh is a marketplace for selling blender tools resources add-ons and it's it spawned out of an idea where there there has been an ongoing debate i would say in all of the open source worlds but particularly blender being open sourced which is how do you offer professional services and time and things like that when the software and all of the code base behind it and all of that is free, um, you know, being, being open source. And so we, we've always taken a stance that look, your time is valuable, no matter what you're doing, whether you are right, building a custom tool, if you are doing contract work, if you are doing whatever it is that you are doing, if that is providing value to other people, or even just value to yourself, your time is valuable. And there was basically, nobody had found a way to sell Blender add-ons yet, even though these tools were incredibly valuable. They were uh, you know, reducing people's production time. They were literally saving people money every single day. But there was a problem in that all of the tools that would be built and released would inherently stop getting maintained because when you're maintaining something for free, you only have time to do it for so long before life takes over and your job takes over and family takes over and suddenly these tools don't work two versions on and they're dead. So nobody within a production world could rely on them. So we basically said, hey, let's let's build a tool. We're going to sell it. Crazy idea. Uh, and by selling it, we'll be able to maintain it in the long term. That tool is now, go for it, Wes. Go take care of your kids. All right, I'm going to go make sure I'll be right back two seconds to finish <laughs> up the stream. Uh, 
And so we, you know, we just decided to do that. And so we sold a tool. It was called Contours. It was a retopology tool. And now, uh, five years later, it's now known as Retopoflow. We are still building it, still selling it, and still maintaining it. That tool was basically the test case to say, will people in the Blender community purchase a tool and pay for it in order to know that it's going to continue being developed? And the answer was yes. And so we decided to go ahead and turn that into a full marketplace. We built the marketplace and that is now three years. Yeah, it's about three years old. Um, oh no, it's almost, it's, uh, it's going to be turning four, I guess. I think if I have my dates right. Um, and really the idea of that has evolved into not only should you be able to sell tools around Blender, but people should be able to make a livelihood with Blender selling tools, models, et cetera. And so we wanted to build a platform to facilitate people, you know, basically being able to have an independent, sustainable livelihood. And so that's kind of become, that's personally my big focus on CG Cookie is building the Blender market, helping the Blender market succeed and grow to the point that people can live off of it. Um, we're, we're getting close. We've grown a lot. Uh, I think we grew 250% in the last 12 months after having you know, basically slow and steady five to 10% growth for two to three years. And now it's really kind of starting to take off. Um, but that's actually the reason that one or one of the reasons that you don't see training from me anymore is because I'm working on the blended market. Um, it's, you know, and there's also, we, ta we haven't taken of, your keyboard and mouse away. Right. So you just using it in other areas. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, I think, you know, if we could, if we could distill it down to one thing, it would basically be that the blender market is the, the goal is to let everybody invest in Blender's future for their for both their own reasons and for the community's sake. So cool. it's been a fun project. It's it's got a long ways to go though. <laughs> I think you I don't know if you probably touched on what I was going, but yeah, with those projects and even if you're looking to start your own business, um, I know Rain, she was mentioning that uh, she's actually looking to launch her online community per pet site and it's currently to do the entire thing. Yeah, that's extremely overwhelming. And this will probably will take one more question after this then we do have to wrap up, but uh, there will be more streams like this as, as we get going. Um, extremely so, having no help at all. Um, I would say any advice you would give to her, Jay, about getting started or how to find help? Um, She's looking to start her own kind of yeah. online community pet site. I, right, I think the advice that I would give is number one, recognize that building a community is one very challenging, um, but it's also something that I think needs to be organic. It's really hard to say, to step out and just build a community and just suddenly have a community that works and is supportive and natural and all that. What I would encourage you to focus on is, you know, most communities are built around something. CG Cookies community has been built around training. Um, initially it was blender training and then concept training and now unity training. And so the, the cohesive thing that's holding everybody together in the community is a love of blender human unity and concept art. So take, take whatever that unifying thing is for you, you, whether that's a, your personal interest or what you want your site to focus on and focus on that aspect. Uh, you know, so let's, let's just say that you're, you're going to try and build a community on, um, RC cars. Focus on building resources that are really good for RC cars and providing those to people and give people a mechanism to get involved, to comment, to, you know, do th just to be a part of it, but don't necessarily focus on the community aspect yet. Give people a route to come in, but for the most part, focus on what you care about there, you know, focus on. It's like scratch your own itch, right? I mean, you said that a yeah, lot. Exactly. Yeah. Scratch your own itch and other people will typically have that same itch and you know, that, that analogy gets real weird real quick. <laughs> <laughs> well, and we'll stop there. I uh, so I'm really excited about uh, the, the game programming bootcamp. I'm, I'm super thrilled to see what you guys create out of that. Um, I know that's one of the big mysteries, at least for me is the programming aspect. I think one of the things as an artist in the, the game industry is you never realize how much programming you have to do. So dig, dig into that one and learn as much as you can. I know I laughed uh, while you were talking, Jake, because he said, uh, said, I thought for a love of cookies is why we've created <laughs> CG Cookie, which is a funny story because having an odd name 
site as that we do uh, obviously lends itself to a lot of fun little marketing things munch on these you know silly name amazing experience uh, tastes great but um when we have the studio if i meet anybody there's always like this general disappointment when people are like cable like your internet guy comes to the studio and wants to hook it up and is like oh you guys don't make cookies i I was supposed to bring a bunch back to the, you know, the office or even at the trade show. I was just at, I was setting this up. And then like these bunch of union people came around the corner like, oh, we've been waiting for you to set up all day. And I'm like, why? He's like, well, cookies, right? And I'm like, no. <laughs> like, Sorry, we don't. Yeah, we don't, we don't have any of those. But so on the note, thanks everyone for hanging out with the stream. I know it's really cool to have you guys as part of the community. These live streams, we're going to do a lot more of them, you know, talking a little bit more about the educational side, but even more kind of what we're replicating within CG Cookie. We talk about just having those streams where we hang out and, and talk about subjects that we all deal with as artists. I think in general artists, we kind of live in introverted lives or we feel like it's by, we're on our own. And I think one of the, the, the future aspects of CG Cookie that we're trying to do with these live streams is let you know that you're not on your own your own you have this community here to support you and uh, hopefully we can touch on some subjects that will help you along the way absolutely yeah i'll just echo that just thanks for joining us everybody it's been it's been fun and you know to see where where cj cookie has gone over the last 10 years is uh humbling to say the least so really appreciate you all being part of it all right thanks everyone enjoy the night day or morning all right Thank now you. have a good one now i get to find the stop streaming button <laughs> You can never find this stuff. No, like, yeah, where is you it? You always got to make sure that there's those few seconds of awkward, like, oh, I said bye, but we're still here. Yeah, all right, let's see. All right, ready? Three, two, one.